Is Ethereum dead? That's the question more and more people are asking. Not only has ETH's performance been subpar, but so have its fundamentals. Ethereum Layer 1 revenues are no longer leading the pack. In terms of market share, Solana captures 73% of Layer 1 revenues, compared to 13% for Ethereum. Solana's monolithic network generates more revenue not only for itself, but also for its applications. Solana dApps capture 65% of application layer revenue, versus 12% for Ethereum dApps. Some are even talking about a sole ETH flippening. The question is a legitimate one, but what exactly are we comparing? Solana is a scalability-first solution, while Ethereum is a decentralization-first solution. The fact that neither goes all-in on either scalability or decentralization, and that both are general-purpose smart contract platforms, creates ambiguity so it might seem logical to compare them. Solana is less performant than a centralized rollup or Binance. Ethereum is less decentralized than Bitcoin. They both make trade-offs with degrees of decentralization and performance. So why not compare them? Solana does offer a UX that's inferior to CEXs, but still far better than Ethereum's. And at a time when meme coin trading demands peak performance, censorship resistance isn't the main priority. The point is to enable rapid creation and permissionless exchange of as many tokens as possible. In that regard, Solana is better suited than a CEX, which requires permission to list and trade new tokens. The growing adoption of Solana compared to Ethereum is worrying some people and giving wings to those who have benefited most over the past few months. Some very serious observers wouldn't be surprised to see Sol flip ETH. I have no issue with challenging the widely accepted assumptions, but even when I tell myself, Let's go. Sol should flip ETH. I'm brought back to this question. What about the next wave of applications? The ones that won't demand maximum performance, but rather a minimum level of decentralization. How limited will Solana be? And how well will Ethereum fit those needs? Worse yet, how limited will both Solana and Ethereum be when an application requires both strong decentralization and high performance? Think of use cases like real-world assets, RWA, enterprise payments and treasury, AI coordination, or DeFi. In one case, Solana is not becoming more decentralizable. In fact, it's becoming less and less so. In the other case, Ethereum has the option to increase its block size. Ethereum can move in that direction if performance becomes a greater demand, whereas Solana cannot backtrack toward decentralization. But ultimately, Ethereum doesn't need to because it delegates that role to its shards, its layer twos. And what if Ethereum's actual thesis was this? Solana is neither decentralized enough nor performant enough, even though those are its only goals. To borrow their own terminology, Solana lacks both bandwidth and throughput. This thesis is made possible thanks to Ethereum's modularity and the zero-knowledge revolution. Indeed, since Vitalik Buterin released Ethereum's new roadmap in late 2022, the roll-up centric vision to scale Ethereum has started to bear fruit. Ethereum's scalability has skyrocketed to the point where it now challenges Solana, while still maintaining an extremely decentralized network. Rollups execute transactions off the main chain, bundle them into batches, and submit them back to the base layer, which is responsible for security. There are two types of rollups, optimistic rollups and ZK rollups. About them, Vitalik stated, My own view is that in the short term, optimistic rollups are likely to win out for general purpose EVM computation, and ZK rollups are likely to win out for simple payments, exchange, and other application-specific use cases. But in the medium to long term, ZK rollups will win out in all use cases as ZK snark technology improves. That's why we focus on ZK rollups in this video. We'll analyze in detail what a ZK rollup is, as well as the different ZK variants chosen by projects. And who will be the next leaders in this great L2 marketplace? Let's get started. ZK rollups work with a prover, a proof generator, that creates a cryptographic proof attesting to the correctness of a given computation without revealing anything beyond its validity and integrity. This proof is then verified by a verifier. Once validated, it can be submitted to layer one, which can then verify the entire batch of transactions using that single proof. This system relies on zero knowledge proofs, ZKPs. A zero-knowledge proof is a cryptographic method that allows someone to prove the truth of a statement without revealing any information other than the fact that the statement is true. How can you prove that a statement is true without revealing the information behind it? How can I prove to you that I'm over 18 without telling you my exact age, name, or address? How can I prove I have $1 million without showing you my full account balance? Well, that's exactly the kind of problem ZKPs are designed to solve. And you'll see. 
It's quite easy to understand with a simple example. To grasp how this works, let's look at the cave example. Let's consider a cave that splits into two paths, path A and path B. To move from A to B, or from B to A, you must open a door using a magic word. Bob wants to prove to Alice that he knows the magic word to open the door, without actually revealing the word to her. This is a proof of knowledge, because Bob proves to Alice that he knows the secret without disclosing the secret itself. Commitment, challenge, and response. Bob and Alice repeat the following scenario multiple times. Commitment. Alice stays outside the cave and can't see inside. Bob enters the cave and randomly chooses to go down path A or path B, e.g. by flipping a coin. Challenge. Alice turns toward the cave entrance and calls out a randomly chosen path, either A or B, asking Bob to return from that path. Response. Bob must prove he knows the magic word by exiting from the path Alice requested even if it wasn't the one he initially took. Alice will be convinced that Bob doesn't know the magic word if he fails the challenge even once. However, if Bob doesn't actually know the word, there's still a 50% chance that he will exit from the correct path by luck. But if they repeat this protocol n times, the probability that Bob keeps getting it right by chance, 1 in 2 to the power of n, as a percentage chance. For example, after 10 repetitions, Bob only has a 0.0009% chance of fooling Alice. If Bob does know the code, the protocol will validate his knowledge with near certainty after just 20 iterations. Because 1 and 2 to the power of 20 equals 99.999.95367%. Always to the end engineer answer. In a blockchain system, Bob and Alice are replaced by algorithms that generate and verify proofs at high speed, adapted to blockchain use cases like privacy and scalability. This ZKP system is used by all ZK rollups. But what exactly differentiates ZK Sync from StarkNet? First, we can distinguish them by separating them into two main categories ZK Snarks and ZK Starks. In both ZK Starks and ZK Snarks, we find the shared acronym ZK, which stands for Zero Knowledge. The ARC stands for Argument of Knowledge, referring back to the ZKP concept we discussed earlier. Now we just need to understand the difference between ST and SN. Let's start with the S in SNARK, which stands for succinct. Succinct means that the proofs generated are extremely compact, often just a few kilobytes. This ensures that the verification time is much shorter than the time required to compute the proof. Without this succinctness, the verifier would have to recompute the full process themselves instead of simply checking a quick proof. Next, the N stands for non-interactive. In an interactive proof, the prover and verifier exchange several messages to establish the validity of a proof, which is how Stark proofs work. Snarks eliminate this need for exchange by making the process non-interactive, meaning that the protocol does not require any interaction between the prover and the verifier. This is in contrast to interactive proofs, which require several round trips between the parties. Snarks use a trusted setup environment in which a shared key, i.e. public parameters, is generated and made available to both the prover and verifier. These public parameters allow the prover to demonstrate knowledge of certain data without actually revealing it. The non-interactive nature of Snarks simplifies the process by reducing it to a single round of communication. This lack of interaction considerably simplifies the process, reduces latency, and improves the scalability of systems using Snarks which also helps preserve user anonymity across the network. And it's precisely this non-interactive aspect that marks the key difference between Snarks and Starks. For Starks, the N in non-interactive is replaced by a T for transparent, meaning the prover and verifier must communicate with each other through a sequence of commitment, challenge, and response. This structure allows Starks to avoid a trusted setup, which can introduce vulnerabilities, a known concern with some Snark implementations. This is where each system makes its own trade-off. Snarks prioritize privacy and limiting scalability. Starks, on the other hand, sacrifice some privacy to gain much greater scalability. Hence the first two letters in Stark. Scalable transparent, followed by argument of knowledge. This trade-off reflects Stark's core design philosophy, to be the most scalable solution possible, specifically built for high-throughput environments. Starks fully embrace their role as Layer 2 technology, designed with the sole purpose of scaling Layer 1 chains. And indeed, we can observe that Starks scale better than Snarks as the number of transactions per second increases. So where does this superior scalability in Starks come from? ZK Starks do not require a trusted setup. They are transparent. Stark proofs are based on hash functions operating under a random oracle model. 
you can think of it as an oracle that you query, and it always returns a seemingly random response. This mimics the ideal behavior of a cryptographic hash function. Stark proofs are interactive, and they make use of a random oracle during their verification phase. This gives them a major advantage, scalability. Indeed, Stark proof verification is very fast, and the time it takes grows sublinearly with the size of the data, unlike SNARKs, which have linear scalability. Starks require high computational resources, which inherently reduces decentralization due to the operational costs involved. Snarks, on the other hand, can more easily support a decentralized network, because they require very little computational power, so much so that projects like Mina Protocol use them to prove their entire Layer 1, leveraging a wide network of provers, made possible precisely because of the low resource requirements. But is this difference really that important when we're trying to determine which one makes the best Layer 2? In a Layer 2 context, decentralization comes from the Layer 1. The Layer 2 posts its data and gets validated by Layer 1, thereby inheriting its decentralization. So the job of the Layer 2 is to scale as much as possible, and on that front, Starks are the best. However, if the question is, which of the two, ZK Stark or ZK Snark, would make a better Layer 1? Then it's clear, snarks win hands down, because in this case, decentralization is the top priority. And who better to evaluate the best type of ZK proof for Layer 1s and Layer 2s than the creator of both snarks and Starks himself? Yes, both technologies were co-developed by the cryptographer Eli Ben Sasson. He first helped create a ZK snark based Layer 1 with Zcash in 2016, and later participated in the development of Mina. Launched in 2020, he then decided to use ZK Starks to scale Ethereum at Layer 2, first with StarkX and later with StarkNet. There are very few rollups using Starks and many more using Snarks, which makes this a great way to filter out the projects that truly interest me. Turn the camera on. There's no budget left for editing. Starks use cryptographic hash functions, making them more scalable, but also more secure than Snarks. They do not require a trusted setup, and they are inherently resistant to quantum attacks. For Web2 centralized systems and blockchain infrastructures looking to prepare for the era of quantum computing, Starks are the best path forward. We often talk about ZK proofs, but Snarks and Starks are actually considered validity proofs, because it's mathematically verifiable that the off-chain computations being proven contain no fraud, and are therefore valid. However, unlike Starks, Snarks are considered true zero-knowledge, because their proofs are not transparent, they fully preserve privacy, and are based on zero-knowledge. So in truth, ZK is more of a subcategory within validity proofs, not a completely separate class. We often use ZK as an umbrella term, but in reality, it refers to something much more specific. Ultimately, rollups rely on two major types of proofs. Validity proofs, fraud proofs used in optimistic rollups. When it comes to determining which technology is best for rollups, it's clear that ZK Starks offer the best scalability. They compress the data of large batches of transactions, delivering the lowest possible transaction costs. And Stark proofs become even more competitive when published and verified on a layer 1 that is both storage constrained and extremely decentralized, such as Ethereum, or in the most extreme case, on Bitcoin, to such an extent that any use of rollups other than Starks on Bitcoin would almost certainly end up being either a sidechain or a sovereign rollup that performs only settlement, without any data availability on the proof-of-work chain. This would require an intermediary, like Celestia, to handle data publication, or even a less secure alternative, like centralized storage, for rollups known as Validium, if ZK-based, or Optimium, if optimistic-based. All of these variants, which add varying degrees of trust to an otherwise trustless system, obviously represent barriers to liquidity adoption, particularly for Ether, and even more so for BTC, which remains the most powerful catalyst in this market cycle. This is why ZK, and more specifically Starks, are a fundamental component of this cycle. Starknet's decision to deploy on Bitcoin is strategic, and not just opportunistic. If you want to know more, watch this video. But first, it's important to understand that Starknet is just the beginning. It's far from being the only one able to take advantage of ZK Stark technology today. Even though there are different trade-offs depending on the use case, between Starks, Snarks, and fraud proofs. They shouldn't be viewed as opposing technologies, because they're not incompatible. In fact, they're complementary. ZK Snarks can be used to prove ZK Starks, and even optimistic proofs can be wrapped in validity proofs, effectively reducing the typical 7-day challenge window. Radically pitting different types of rollups, whether optimistic or ZK, against one another isn't necessarily the right way to evaluate projects, 
especially those backed by strong development teams. Most teams understand the value of ZK technology for their projects, but they still consider it too heavy or inefficient at present. They are, however, aware of the ongoing and future advancements in this field, a space that is, importantly, deeply open source. More and more projects, marketed as ZK rollups, are actually launching as optimistic rollups in their early stages. This is the case with Movement, Eclipse, and MegaETH. Likewise, projects initially branded as optimistic rollups are now actively integrating ZK modules and ZK virtual machine builders to make ZK adoption smoother across the ecosystem. This is evident with Optimism Superchain and its collaboration with Risk Zero and Succinct Labs. If ZK is indeed the endgame, we still shouldn't completely discard today's optimistic rollups. Initiatives like OP Succinct or hybrid rollups Kailua from Risk Zero aim to make optimistic rollups ZK provable. Even the various types of ZK systems are beginning to merge. For instance, the Electron project enables agnostic aggregation of ZK proofs, regardless of their underlying type. Another example is SP1 by Succinct Labs, which can generate both Stark and Snark proofs using its ZK virtual machine, ZKVM. SP1 combines efficient Stark recursion with a Groth16 wrapper, a Snark proof, enabling recursive transformation from Stark to Snark. This reduces the overall proof size and allows for verification by any Rust-based program or EVM-compatible chain at a cost of about 300,000 gas. ZK proofs still have a long way to go and will continue to surprise us with their diverse and evolving use cases. Let me know in the comments if you'd like a video where I go deeper into innovative projects leveraging ZK tech, like Zoda, which enables Celestia to use data sampling in a collaborative and lightweight way for the prover. The modular war has already progressed significantly behind the scenes, long before its formal declaration. Then there's Electron ZK plus TE aggregation layer, a dual system that Vitalik Buterin has called inevitable in his latest writings. This kind of ZK agnostic aggregation fundamentally changes the game for Ethereum and Bitcoin's roll-up constrained ecosystems. More recently, Vitalik proposed a radical idea to make Ethereum more future-proof in a ZK-centric world, replacing the EVM with a RISC-V virtual machine. I won't go into full detail here, but adding RISC-V as a backend for smart contracts would drastically reduce ZK proof generation costs. With RISC-V, Ethereum would optimize merkleization using hash functions tailored for validity proofs. Depending on the type of proof, Ethereum could even become quantum resistant, as with RISC-0, which allows for stark generation. This would allow Ethereum to continue supporting solidity, while also enabling high-efficiency Rust programming. The EVM wasn't built with ZK in mind, but RISC-V was designed for it. This is an extremely bullish development for Ethereum's future. Finally, I could also tell you about IBC Eureka, which uses the SP1 Prover Network and ZK Lite clients to make IBC compatible with various EVM chains. I hope this video helped you understand the differences between the various types of rollups, and realize that Ethereum's future is far from being, yes, secure, but unusable for most of us. On the contrary, Ethereum is making the bold bet that it's possible to be secure, decentralized, and performant all at once. Ethereum is not dead. If you haven't yet seen it, I invite you to check out the video that explains how Bitcoin could one day verify rollups like StarkNet. It all starts with an idea presented by Eli Ben Sassen back in 2013. Click the video to learn more.